Hi guys, welcome back to Paradise Lost in Books. I'm Christy, and today we are talking about A Court of Wings and Bruin by Sarah J. Mass. Oh my god, I've been wanting to do this video for so long, but I mean, the book has been out for like two months, but I've just, time has gotten away from me, I've been really busy, and it just hasn't happened yet, but I have been dying to talk about this book, so let's just jump right into the synopsis, which you can't do a spoiler-free synopsis of the third book in a series. I mean, you just can't do it. So just go away if you haven't read the first two. There's nothing for you here. Just go read the other two books and come back later. Okay, so for those of you that haven't read it yet, this book picks up where we left off in A Court of Mist and Fury. Farah and Reese got married. She's the High Lady of the Night Court, but she's playing a role. Tamlin thinks that she was under Rhysand's control the whole time and now she's coming back to live with him and she's going to be kind of like a spy figure in the spring court. War is coming to Prithian. We know the king of Highburn is really starting to ramp up his game and Farrah's got to make some tough choices and tough calls in how she's going to handle that and what the outcome and fates of her friends and family is going to be. So that's really all I think I can say for spoiler free. So go ahead and read the book and come back and listen to my thoughts and feelings on the wrap up to the main A Court of Thorns and Roses series. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about with this book, kind of like with the other A Court of Thorns and Roses videos that I did. I'm not gonna just do likes and dislikes like with most books. I have a bunch of different things I wanna talk about. So first I think I'm gonna talk about some of the aspects of the book that I did like as well as some of my favorite scenes. I loved getting the backstories on these characters more. Like we learned so much more about more about Amran. Even more minor characters like the Bone Carver and the Weaver became major players in this story and it was so interesting to actually learn more about where they came from and get to know those characters and fill them out a little bit more. They weren't just random one-offs. They became major figures in the story. I also really enjoyed that the mating bond was explained a little bit more. They go into more depth about how the mating bond works, mostly because Lucian and Elaine aren't really working things out and Farrah's kind of like, what's going on here? They talk about if the mating bond can be rejected, if you can marry someone else even though you have a mating bond, and how all that stuff works. And I felt like it really cleared up a lot of issues that people may have had previously about the whole possessiveness. Because that's one complaint I have about Throne of Glass is there's not really a good explanation. It's just, it's a whole lot of just, she belongs to me. Whereas I feel like with this series, she took a little more care in showing how it's a more of an equal partnership. And yes, there's some territorialism, but first of all, it's on both sides. It's not just the man being, or fey male being territorial. It's both of them. And there's a reason for it. And it's not without your will. Like you consent to the mating bond. It's not forced upon you. And I really like that she took care not to force the mating bond on Elaine because Elaine's been traumatized. Like she needed time to get over the things that had happened to her. You can't just change her complete identity and then be like, by the way, your soulmate is here. There you go. I mean, that's not how any of this works. I also really liked the infighting in the inner circle. I feel like it added an element of realism, which was really appreciated because I'm definitely going to get into detail a little bit later about some unrealistic things in this book. And don't give me that crap about this is fantasy. It's meant to be unrealistic. I know, but you still expect characters and events to go a certain way for it to be believable fantasy. I mean, just because it's fantasy doesn't mean things have to be ridiculous. I really appreciated that they acknowledge that Tamlin isn't evil. Yeah, he's a dick. Yeah, he's selfish. Yeah, he did some really screwed up things. But I never for one second felt like he was evil. I was never one of those people that were screaming for his head on a pike. Like, some people were super mad at him at the end of Akamath, and I get it. He screwed Farah over big time. But I explained a little bit how I thought Tamlin's motivations were playing out in my Akamath book talk. But I really appreciated it showing him as that double agent. Like, did you guys really think that he was just going to be straight evil? 
like, no, he's not going to just totally turn on his country. He was definitely playing a double agent role. And while with Farah, he may have been selfish and manipulative and really done some things to hurt her, he's not rotten to the core. Like, I just was, I was very angry at him, but it made sense. Like, by the time we get to the end of the novel, I think you can really understand Hamlet and why he did the things he did, even if you don't agree with him and you still think he's a huge dick for doing what he did to Farah. That's valid. But he had his reasons for the role he played in the war, and I think it makes perfect sense for his character. Going back to Elaine and Lucian for a second, I really... I think going into the book, I had hoped for some fluffiness between Elaine and Lucian. But like I said, I understand why it didn't happen. Like, you can't just let go of all of those horrible things that have happened to you. And it also kind of made it a little easier to swallow that literally almost everyone in this book had to be in a relationship. Even Amryn. Like, I would have been 100% okay with Amryn not being in a relationship. Like, sure, it was cute. I did enjoy it. I'm not saying it was a bad thing in and of itself, but I just don't understand why each and every person either had to be in a relationship or had to have their lack of a relationship explained more. <laughs> like, I just don't feel like it was necessary, but regardless, the relationships were enjoyable. It was just, why can't someone just be single and it not even be an issue? Like, we don't have to talk about it. It's just some Sometimes people aren't in relationships and that's okay. I love Lucian and Farrah's relationship. I love having a whole like chapter, I think, of them like toughing it out in the woods and having to work together. I've always loved Farrah and Lucian's relationship, but I feel like we really got to understand it on a deeper level in this book. And we really got to see some of those complex emotional workings at hand because Lucian's really torn. I mean, he's betraying Tamlin, even though Tamlin saved his life. I mean, he would not be alive without Tamlin. So obviously he feels the strong loyalty to him, but it was just really nice to see that relationship be a little bit more fleshed out and to give Lucian a bigger role in the story, even though he disappeared about halfway through. <laughs> Speaking of scenes with Lucian, can we just talk about how glad I am that the Children of the Blessed were a thing again? I hate when authors put something into the story and it's just like completely forgotten about. I love that the whole idea of the Children of the Blessed being worshippers of the Fae, trying to cross the border, thinking this great life was going to be waiting for them. I love that that was addressed again and brought up within the context that we were originally introduced to the children of the blessed like we see this group of children coming across the border and they're like oh our face saviors and Farah's like oh shit get out of here what are you doing it's just nice that it wasn't a random thing i'm glad that it came full circle and we could kind of see both aspects of the fae and how we know that there's good fae which Farah now knows but we also know there's bad fae and it seems in the human realm there's no in between. They don't see the Fae as a spectrum of good and evil, like how humans are, but you have like the children of the blessed who are like the Fae are God and people who were like Farah in the first book who just hate the Fae. So it's kind of cool that we got both ends of the spectrum dealing with the children of the blessed. And I really appreciate that Farah absolutely destroyed them for killing the children of the blessed because it just shows how far Farah has come as a character. I mean, in the first book, she was scoffing at the Children of the Blessed and thinking that they deserve whatever horrible fate came to them. And then by book three, she's defending them against the evil Fae who are just trying to slake their bloodlust. So fantastic character development for Farah. It was truly enjoyable through all three books seeing how much she grew and changed. I still don't like Nesta. I still don't. I finished all three books. I saw Nesta's journey from start to finish. I still don't like her. I'm sorry. It's just never going to happen. Nesta, you're a bitch, and I don't like you. It's just, it's just how it is. I'm sorry. I am glad that she and Elaine had bigger roles in the book. It was nice to kind of get to know them and try and understand what had been happening to them as a result of their being forced to turn into Fae. Okay, so some of my favorite scenes. <laughs> Farrah sending the bog after Highburn's henchmen, Bagda and Branagh. <laughs> That was hilarious. It just made me think of like a cartoon kind of situation where they're just like curled up in a ball, like crying and sucking their thumbs. Like it was just hilarious. I love Alice. She's amazing. I'm sad that she left for the summer court and I wish we had seen her more, but I love the scene with her and Farah where Alice is like, bitch, I'm on your game. I know what you're doing. 
it's fine just be smart and they got what she deserved it was fantastic and perfect and more power to you Farah, because that was the perfect death for Ianthe. I just, I loved it. I love the reuniting scene where she got to see Reese again. That was wonderful and beautiful and adorable. Possibly my absolute favorite scene in the book <laughs> was when they had all the High Lords assembled and Tamlin comes swaggering in late, like, yeah, bitch, I'm here. What of it? <laughs> and he's just like digging at Farah the whole time time like he's being such an asshole but it is so funny like when he asks reese that question about making her climax i was like physically cringing but also laughing at the same time like <laughs> it was really golden honestly farah kind of deserved it a little bit the surreal's death was like an unexpected emotional blow like i loved that scene and i love how the surreal actually became an important character in the story but the fact that it died, I was just like, what the hell? Like, why are you doing this to me? I don't, this, this isn't okay. This is wrong. Why? Why? But it was a really well done scene. It left me very emotional. I love the scene where all three of the sisters are laying together after they save Elaine from Hybern's camp. That was just such a really great scene for showing how far all three of them have come as sisters and as people slash Faye. Like, it just really cemented that bond between them and kind of set the stage for the things that happen later. There were some really great scenes from the battle, like specific moments throughout that really stuck with me. Like Reese's speech before the battle was excellent. The part where her dad comes in with the three ships named after the girls was beautiful and totally unexpected. I did not see that coming. That whole like humans coming to the rescue thing was stupendous. Like I thoroughly enjoyed that and I loved that their dad came to save them. That was unbelievably well done. It's really, really sad that their dad died, but I loved Elaine coming into the rescue, being the one to strike that killing blow and really come into her own as a fae. Like, that was badass as fuck, and I loved it. I loved Amran taking her full form and destroying the shit out of everything. That was epic, and everything I wanted from Amarin. Like, she just laid waste. It was fantastic. I loved Tamlin contributing to bringing Reese back. That was really touching, and I loved how he was just like, be happy, Farah. Like, what's between us? What's done is done. I'm over it. It's okay. Let's just move on with our lives. I'm really mad that the only court that we never got to see was the day court. That was the one I was most interested in because it's the scholarly court, and the one that I personally identify the most with. So I really hope in one of the forthcoming novellas that we're gonna get to see the day court because it's the only one we haven't seen from inside that court. And that makes me really sad. I also thought that Pharaoh was gonna kill Tamlin. I mostly thought that because I really thought that Sarah J Maas was gonna take the villain angle with Tamlin and make him into a bad guy. But I'm really glad she didn't do that. Like I would have been pretty disappointed if she had done that. But I also thought we were gonna get multiple POVs in this book. I thought she was gonna be in the spring court a little bit longer than she was and that we would see like her POV and then Reese's POV before they came back together. So I love this book, don't get me wrong, but I rank it under Akamath and there's a few reasons for that. This is gonna be the kind of dissatisfaction section of the video. So the spring court thing I was just talking about, I felt like it was a little rushed. I'm glad that we weren't there for too long, because that would have been boring too, but I feel like we just didn't quite strike the balance of being there long enough for it to be believable that she achieved something and being there too long. I didn't like seeing Farah as a manipulative bitch. Like, what she did to Tamlin was wrong. Like, I'm sorry, regardless of how you feel about Tamlin, it was wrong of her to turn his court against him for no other reason than petty revenge. I realized that she had every right to be mad at him and what he did to her was super, super wrong, but that was it was just petty and wrong and she had no good reason to turn his court against him like that. Nesta's power, I don't feel like that was really explained satisfactorily. Like, what is her power? Is her power actually death? Or is it just cauldron power and the cauldron is death? Like, it's just, it was never really explained. Like, maybe we'll get more about that in the novellas. That would be super cool. But it just kind of left me feeling like deus ex magic power. You know, like, it just felt too convenient and it wasn't very well explained. So it just 
made it a little bit less enjoyable to read about her power when I didn't really understand what was going on with it. The scene where Cauldron, the Cauldron, steals Elaine felt really strange and random. It didn't seem to serve any real purpose other than, by the way, Tamlin's actually on our side. Like, they stole her and then immediately got her back. Like, I don't know, maybe they were just trying to show that the King of Highborn isn't as powerful as he thinks he is. I don't know, but just that whole scene was just really strange and I liked seeing that Tamlin was on our side, of course, but other than that, there didn't really seem to be any good reason for having that scene. Kind of my biggest complaint with this book is that it was just very predictable. I feel like and of course, I'm not trying to put words or thought into anyone's mind here. So like, this is just me thinking about it if I was the author of this book series. I feel like maybe she saw how much people love this series and how successful it was and decided to take the safe route with the final book. I was expecting to have my emotions torn out of me and stomped on. Like, I really thought some massive shit was gonna go down and it really just didn't. Sure, the battle was epic, but no one died. Like, my minor characters died. Their dad died. That was sad. The Bone Carver and the Weaver died. Sad. Like, that's fine, but it's just very unrealistic that no High Lords died and no one from the Inner Circle died. Like, I just have such a hard time believing that. I get that they're great warriors, but even JK Rowling killed some major characters. Like, come on, grow some backbone. Like, we will forgive you for killing main characters if it's done in a realistic way. I'm not saying it wasn't well written and emotional, because it definitely was, but it was just predictable and it was the safe option. And possibly the even bigger complaint that comes from within that is I'm really, really tired of the fake out, both in books in general, but specifically in Sarah J. Mass's works. And I'm really not trying to be critical of her as a writer here, because her books are some of my favorite books of all time. Like, A Court of Thorns and Roses has easily become one of my top three favorite book series of all time. So please don't take me as this bashing, but this is just what I personally, as a reader, am reading and observing and kind of bothers me. I'm really tired of the fake out. We got faked out so many times over this whole entire series. Let me count the ways. The Blight was a fake out. Fair as death, fake out. Reese's identity, fake out. Who Farrah's mate is, fake out. Not that she ever specifically said Tamlin was Farrah's mate, but it was obvious that you were supposed to leave Akatar thinking that she was gonna be with Tamlin. I mean, those are just some of the major ones, guys, but I feel like there's more. I just didn't write them down because I didn't think about it when I was rereading, and I obviously didn't want to go back through the books just to find more fake outs. But I feel like there were so many fake outs, so many major plot points revolved around the idea of subverting the reader's expectations, which is fine when done sparingly. But once you get to the final book in a series and your big climax is another death fake out, that was disappointing. I was not at all surprised when she faked out Reese's death. Like, as soon as I read the line that was like, and Resand was dead or whatever, I was like, oh. Like, I couldn't even have a genuine emotional reaction to it because I was so exhausted of all the fake outs. It was just very disappointing because even though it was emotional and well done, I definitely felt Ferris pain. For me as a reader, I didn't commit emotionally fully to the scene because I was just like, you know, obviously he's not really dead. Like, I knew she wasn't gonna really kill him and it was, it was just disappointing. It was disappointing, and I wish that she had committed. Also, Amarin. Amarin was another fake out. Amarin should have stayed dead. I love Amarin, and she's awesome, and probably my second favorite in the inner circle, but that was a death she should have committed to, okay? It would have been much more believable and would have left me feeling a lot less dissatisfied with the ending of this series. I just can't believe that we went through all of that emotional turmoil just for, and they all lived happily ever after. That was aggravating for me as a reader. Overall, I gave the book four out of five stars. I didn't like it as much as A Court of Mist and Fury, but I still really enjoyed it. And I think as a whole, it was a well done finale to the main part of the series. There are some things I wish she had done differently, but overall it was a solid ending and 
I still would highly recommend this series to anyone who enjoys fantasy. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, guys. Comment down below and let me know what you think. I know some people were really happy with the ending and didn't have that disappointed feeling I did. So, you know, are we in solidarity or do you disagree with me? I would love to hear your thoughts, so please tell me. I do hope you will like and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Bye.